So here's the knot which in our table uh, in the back of the book is tabulated as 6-2. Um, and there's not really a lot that we can get out of this notation, 6 subscript 2. Um, it's kind of, it's a little bit archaic, the, the subscript at least is archaic. The number 6 has an obvious correlation with the diagram, right? What is 6 in relation to this knot? 6 is just the number of crossings in this lowest terms knot diagram for this knot. And the subscript really just is kind of which order was this six crossing knot discovered by the person who tabulated this stuff in the 1920s, <laughs> basically. Uh, so I think they did try to order them in increasing order of complexity somehow, um, but really that's kind of a vague notion for us so far. So really we're just going to think of this as the second variety, the second flavor of six crossing knot. Um, so first question for today um, is how to take this knot and determine a tangle. Determine a tangle number. And attempt to have that tangle number stand in as an invariant for knots in some way. So determine the tangle number for this knot. And the question that I have for all of us in, in doing that process um, is, is this an invariant? And in particular, what choices did we have to make? What choices do we make along the way and do these choices potentially affect our answer? Because what we don't want is we don't want a way of determining an invariant for a knot that actually isn't an invariant, right? If you and I can follow the same process but make different choices and get different answers at the end of the day, um, then it would seem that this is not a good procedure for us to classify knots, right? Um, so first thing I want for us to do um, is to work through this exercise a couple of different times, making a couple of different sets of choices, um, and then figure out whether those choices did end up mattering or not. Um, and along the way, we're going to grapple with that question of, OK, now we've determined a tangle. How do we actually realize it in its twist form so that we can make the process of finding a continued fraction a little bit more easy? So the first choice we made was to try to clip this top loop and this loop on the bottom left. And then after stretching those out, we got this tangle um, that we struggled a little bit to figure out how to arrange it into a nice twist form uh, to compute its tangle number. So we tried again. So if instead we chose these two loops, so cut it here, cut it there, one of the advantages that that has is that there's just that one crossing in between those two um, that we kind of isolate, and that becomes just a, a part of uh, just that, that one crossing that's there in the middle. Um, and doing it this way, we kind of are able now to isolate here on the right side. this crossing. Uh, so we decided that was, what, a negative 2? Um, and then there's a crossing here in the middle, which was a positive 1. And then after we untwist that and we untwist this, then we have um, negative 3 stacked up vertically on this side. Uh, but then, so sort of jumping ahead, um, let's try and use this to figure out how to work backwards uh, into, into what we're looking for. So the claim is um, that the continued fraction 3, 1, 2, uh, which builds for us this tangle, so two horizontal twists, followed by a twist on the bottom, positive twist, followed by three positive twists on the right, and then closed up using the numerator closure, that that's supposed to be equivalent, right, a master equivalent to the knot 6, 2. Um, so let's see if we can figure out how to make these crossings correspond, which correspond to which. If we're going to rearrange this, then maybe we'll try to make this top loop here this red loop here, because it's sort of, what we can see is that it's crossing over and under the same strand yeah. immediately, right? And that's what's happening here in my group of two. Um, and then the next crossing that we see happening on either side 
is crossing under a new strand now, right? Um, or is it? And then I feel like that one in the middle is the, the one is the one cross. This feels like the one. So yeah. somehow this feels like the two. This feels like the one. This feels like the three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Um, let's try and push that around uh, and, and see if that actually works. So when we actually sort of put this onto the table and start shifting it around, when we build the three one two um, tangle and then push its loops around, we can figure out which crossings correspond to which, um, and we do get kind of this rational tangle uh, presented in the way that, that we have it here. And plus, the virtue of having it in this form is that then um, this gives us a common notation. It's called the Conway notation. So that's the, one of the new bits of terminology for today. Uh, the Conway notation for this knot just takes those integers and it just takes out it takes them all out and just lists them on a, on a line. So three, one, two for this knot. Um, and so it gives us a, a recipe for building this knot out of a rational tangle. Um, and so it's an example of if we know the Conway notation, we can then know exactly how to build a knot from it. And if we start with a rational number, written in its continued fraction form, canonical continued fraction form, then we can turn that rational number into a Conway notation and then use that Conway notation to build a knot. Right. So we have this, we know now how to walk this pathway forward. Somebody hands me a rational number, I can produce a knot out of it in this standard fashion. Um, the question, is whether going the other direction, we're always going to end up with the same rational number. Because let's actually figure out where the black loops in this diagram were. Maybe that's what we should have been doing. <laughs> let's figure out where, where of which, where do we pin this knot down in order to make this the, the numerator closure of the 312 tangle. So if we just look at where the reds connect up with the greens here, uh, it means that the loops are there and there. Well, so, the, uh, no, the other one's between yellow and green. Uh, oh, you're right. So if we match up where the strands actually connect, uh, it looks like here's where we're creating our rational tangle. So if I cut here and I cut there, um, now it looks like uh, we have a presentation uh, for this rational tangle. But that's not at all obvious, right? Um, and so we'd like to know that if we make a different choice of where to cut this tangle, that we still end up with the same Conway notation. In other words, the same continued fraction, the same tangle uh, at the end of the day. Uh, if that's true, then this Conway notation makes for a good invariant uh, for a knot. But if that's not true, then we need to sort of understand in what way it can fail to be true. Um, so maybe what we should do next um, is take a simpler example, maybe it has a little bit less going on, uh, and see if we can break, see if we can ride this horse until it breaks. Um, so let's do that. Let's make our lives a little easier um, by looking at a simpler knot. Fewer crossings, one fewer crossing, uh, and so a little bit less going on. This is the knot 5-2. So I'll put this into our diagram here. So here's 5, 2. And one of the things that needs to be true about any way in which we build an invariant for a knot is knots don't care what's, what's vertical, what's horizontal. right? That should be a base observation uh, for this whole process. So ultimately, it needs not to matter whether we decide to build our knot by taking the numerator closure of a tangle, which closes up the top and the bottom, or taking the denominator closure of a tangle, which closes up the left and the right sides. Why they're called numerator and denominator closures is a, a historical aspect of Conway's paper in which, he, um, in which he establishes that this is in fact an equivalent, or an invariant, sorry, for knots. Um, but either one of these two 
uh, ways of turning a knot into a tangle should give me the same answer because the knot shouldn't care whether it is the numerator closure of something or whether it's the denominator closure of something. Um, the only requirement somehow, uh, and this is an exercise to think about that we've alluded to before, is that for a given tangle, for a given tangle G, uh, exactly one of the numerator closure of G and the denominator closure of G is actually going to be a knot. The other is a link. And so if we're looking for a definition that's always going to ensure that we get a knot out of this, then we can just sort of agree together that the numerator closure would be the one that we want to use um, with the understanding that if we did, we've made the wrong choice, we made the opposite choice from a given tangle, instead of getting the knot back, we might get a link back. Um, but whatever process we use to get a tangle, if we start with numerator closure to get a tangle, numerator closure then gives us back the knot at the end of the day. And so, the top right is the other. Yeah, inspired yeah. by our last example, uh, what we kind of would like is we'd like to see this set of twists down here seem like they belong together. Right? Uh, and then the twists up at the top seem like they belong together. And so where those come together would be then where we decide to make our cuts. So that argues for, uh, well, so yeah, we could decide to cut here, for example. Um, but then if we cut there, so after we pull the, after we put some binder clips on the X's here and then pull those loops as far apart as we can to isolate the crossings, then here is the tangle uh, that we get out here in the middle. Uh, so what would be the Conway notation for this Sorry, what would be the continued fraction notation for this tangle? Um, 12, 8, 3, mm -hmm. 2. 3, 2. Okay. So here's my 3 on this side. Here's my 2 on the right side. So Conway notation would be 3, 2. So as a continued fraction, What would be the tangle number for this tangle? Three plus one over two, which would be seven halves. Seven halves. That's so nice. So this example works out really nicely, right? Um, and one of the drawbacks of this example is that the continued fraction that we got wasn't in its canonical form, right? Because the length of this wasn't an odd number. Um, so maybe this is a good place to pause and ask, how would I put the continued fraction 3, 2? How would I put that into canonical form? What's the one step that's kind of missing here? 3, 1, 1. We would just make it 3, 1, 1. We would take that 2 that's down here in the denominator, and we would turn it into 1 over 1 plus 1, we turn it into 1, 1, plus 1 over 1. Right. 3, 1, 1. Uh, and the way to see why that's the same is this very last um, crossing that's over here on, on this side. If we wanted to, we could just sort of pull it so that it was a vertical crossing instead of a horizontal crossing. Okay. Right? So there's always that ambiguity about whether the first crossing that you, uh, that you make when you're building a tangle is vertical or horizontal. Um, and so, wait, now I'm a little misgiven about this. Hold on. So this gives us now a way of talking about an invariant really for any knot which can be described as the numerator closure of a rational tangle. Uh, and so that class of knots we call the rational knots. Um, but what's surprising, maybe, um, is that not every knot is a rational knot. Um, there are some examples of knots that are not the numerator closures of rational tangles. Um, this is something I ask you to think a little bit about on the homework. Um, but you have to actually go pretty far into his table uh, to find the first such example that breaks the pattern. Uh, do you see it there? We're not going to find any examples of knots that aren't rational until we get all the way out to eight crossings. Uh, and even then, mm. um, yeah, most of the eight crossing knots, most of the eight crossing knots are still rational. 
Um, there, but there are several that aren't, including 8.5 uh, and 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18. That also, I think, gives us a clue to the historical discovery of these knots, right? That it seems like the first, the, well, the first four eight-crossing knots, the simplest four eight-crossing knots are rational, but then the fifth one was irrational. But then a bunch more were discovered that were rational. Um, but then toward the end of the eight-crossing knot alphabet, <laughs> there's a bunch, all of which are not rational. 815 all the way out through 821 uh, are all not rational knots. Um, so there is some sense in which this notation conveys complexity, um, but it's not clear that that's systematic in any way. It's really just more of a historical um, uh, historical ordering of how these knots were discovered. So at the beginning of the hour, we had this rational tangle, which was, um, which was represented by the number 12 fifths. Um, which we decided was 2, 2, 2 as a continued fraction in its canonical form. Right? Um, so it might be worth asking if we build this 2 2 2 tangle and then form its numerator closure, what do we get? So, first of all, when you take a look at that numerator closure, is that a knot or is that a link? I'll follow the way around. Yeah, just follow, follow one of the strands. Let's say I follow oh, yeah. this one right here. It ends up connecting back up to itself. And the other strand, likewise. So so 2, 2, 2 in its Conway notation doesn't actually represent a knot. So this feels like another limitation of the Conway notation, is that by itself, it doesn't distinguish between knots and links. Right? There is a chance. You might say a 50-50 chance <laughs> that when I write down a continued fraction in Conway notation that I might not get a knot. What I might end up with is a link. Um, and when you look up 2, 2, 2 in Conway notation in Adam's tabulation in the back of the book, um, you'll see that it does correspond to a link, uh, which is notated 6, 3, 2, like this. It's a two-component link which has six crossings and which is the third uh, such link in the tabulation. Um, and it has a nice kind of, has a neat looking presentation there on page 288. Um, so I'd say that this is another limitation of Conway notation, is that you could get a knot, you could get a link, and it's kind of an interesting question. Um, this would be a good little research question. How can we tell, just based on the Conway notation, uh, whether or not we end up with a knot or whether we end up with a link? Is there something about the continued fractions that could tip us off uh, to that being the case?